Uh, I am Linda Hadley, uh, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Turner College. And I want to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. This is our first uh, for the academic year in our executive speaker series. And we are so pleased and so fortunate this morning to have our very own mayor, Teresa Tomlinson, as our executive speaker. Uh, mayor Tomlinson had, was elected the 69th mayor in 2010. She won by over, uh, a, a, let's see, over 68% of the vote. Amazing. She won re-election uh, in 2014 with 63% of the vote. She is a very, very popular, a very strong mayor. Um, she has five times been named to Georgia Trends uh, 100 Most Influential Georgians list which says a lot about her and does a great, uh, is a great image for Columbus, Georgia, to have a mayor who is on the list of 100 most in influential Georgians. Uh, she is currently serving as the chair of the board of trustees of Sweetbriar College. That is her alma mater. It's an all-woman's college. It's still all female, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. all right. Still all-woman's college. And I happen to go to an all-woman's college, too. So we have that in common. Um, it, but it's located in Virginia. And the college was on the verge of closing because of fiscal concerns. And she and a group of other alums got together and saved that college from extinction. Mm -hmm. Because many all or single sex, particularly the all female schools, uh, have had a lot of trouble because of declining enrollment mm -hmm. and funding. But she serves on the as the chair of the board of trustees of that university. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting then is that she probably has some unique perspectives mm -hmm. about higher education as well that she might share. Uh, she is married to uh, Wade, uh, who is commonly referred to as Tripp Tomlinson. He is an attorney here in Columbus. She is an attorney. She was an attorney before becoming mayor. She practiced law and was a partner in a large law firm in Columbus and retired after 16 years. Following her career as an attorney, she served as the executive director of Midtown, and that is a nonprofit community renewal organization that has worked really hard to renew the center of Columbus. Um, Mayor Tomlinson grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. She is a graduate, as I said, of Sweetbriar College, and she went to law school at Emory University. She has uh, had a stellar career full of being a lot of first to this and first that. We are very fortunate to have her as our speaker, but not nearly as fortunate to have her as the mayor mm -hmm. of Columbus, Georgia. Let's welcome our mayor, Teresa Thomas. Thank you so much. It's so kind. Well, thank you, Dean Hadley. Actually, Dean Hadley and I go way back. She's one of the very first people I met when I moved to Columbus many, many years ago. And it's great to see you all in here. Thank you for coming out. Know that you have a, a city of very serious bona fides. Uh, in fact, we're the 16th largest consolidated government in the nation. So when I went to Harvard for the Kennedy School of Government um, as a mayor, we had a, a foundation in, in Columbus, a national foundation chose Columbus as one of the mayors to attend, and people couldn't get over the fact that we had a consolidated government mayor in the room. And they were from all over, all over the country. They were like, oh, you, you're the consolidated government mayor? Yeah, yeah, I am. That's Columbus, Georgia for you. Um, good days and bad days. There's actually a picture that I wish I had thought of ahead of time because I'd put it up here and just leave it. Um, and, and maybe there'll be some more questions about this. But one of the worst days of being mayor was the day we were sued by other elected officials. Does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? Anybody read? Jack, <laughs> Dean, y'all need to read the paper. Um, but uh, but that was there was a day where the media came and they were uh, there had been a very raucous press conference by uh, the lawyers for elected officials and they uh, were talking about how the mayor and the city council are horrible people and they wanted more money and all this. Those are the kinds of things that they thought felt good and got them some media attention for that moment. But when the media called to ask for my response and I came, there's a picture when they're doing sound checks before the, the press conference starts and I'm sitting there. And I don't, there's no tears in my eyes. I don't look mad. I mean, there's nothing. You might not even notice. That's why I wish we had the picture. 
but I notice because I can see in my eyes kind of the vacancy of the moment because I was thinking about how horrible this was for Columbus, Georgia and how needless it was. That, that for that moment in time, a few folks thought they could better their interest and get some drama going on and leverage an, an, an end, an objective they had in mind, and they threw the credibility and the sanctity of our government under the bus. And so that was, I would say, the worst, the lowest day. Uh, your city was vindicated. They were thrown out of court, by the way, and two of them lost their election. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, but, um, but it, it just goes to show you the citizens are watching. They care. And um, sometimes, not all the time, um, mischief makers um, get their due. But I say all that to say government's important. So I'm going to get around because they're going to give me the high sign when I've talked too long. And so I hope to get through most of this. Government is so important. Um, how many business majors do we have in the room? Okay. And how about uh, there are computer science people, technology? Oh, I'm surprised we don't have more than that. But anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, if people, particularly in business, computer science, I mean, what do they care about government? I mean, you know, what's, what does anything they're going to do have to do with government? Government touches your life every single day, every single minute of every single day. And if you think you can ignore it or not care about it or let other people, just because they're louder and you don't want to get involved, run it, you are ceding a lot of civic power. You're, you're ceding your potential, your opportunities for success. Government is the framework through which your business will or will not be successful. Everybody here thinks the free market is just its own little thing. You know, well, I'm all about free market. Why do you think that market's free? <coughs> Why do you think it's free? It is free because we have laws and regulations and courts that oversee your ability to access it. Or else somebody a lot more powerful than you will make sure you never get in. But it's the government and it's the courts making sure you have access to success. And you can, you can have a bakery, you can have a million dollar bakery, but if somebody else owns water, you ain't making any muffins. You can make the greatest widget in the world, but if somebody else owns the streets that your trucks need to move them on, you ain't selling any widgets. And so when people get on TV and tell you to hate the government, that person's selling something you don't need to be buying. There's something going on there. I don't know what. I'm not casting dispersions. But when someone tells you to hate the government, you need to take a second, second look at what's going on. Because in this country, the government's us. The government's us. And the government is what provides us the access and the stability to do all the things you want to do. So don't make the mistake of thinking that um, you're just going to do your own thing and not care about the government, not care about who's elected, because you know, who cares what, who the mayor is, who cares who the governor is. If I hear one more time, and trust me, this isn't something I, I've, I've been interested in government. I told you I majored in government. So 30 years I've been interested in this. If I've heard once, I've heard a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. It doesn't matter who the president is. Yes, it does. It doesn't matter who the gover governor is. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It very, very, very much matters. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, my political background, just so you guys know that what I'm talking about is my perspectives of government and, and not necessarily party politics. Because we as a people today love to play small game ball and just talk about parties. 
and, and we're missing the bigger point of the government. So I ain't gonna talk about parties. I'm only gonna be talking about government, leadership, and business today. I'm a nonpartisan mayor. I didn't have to declare a, a party to run. Um, I'm a child of the 80s, so I grew up in the Reagan Revolution. Uh, when I first voted, I was uh, voting for Republicans. I worked for Reagan Bush. I worked for Republican John Warner on Capitol Hill. I've seen that. I understand that. Jumped the fence in 1991 and voted for Bill Clinton. Worked for Democrats all along, and pretty much I'm still a Democrat. Uh, unless they put up a real boob and then, you know, I got to vote for the right person. But I'm, I'm a pretty serious Democrat. So I tell you that so you know. So I'm not pulling any punches here. That, that's my background. But the fact of the matter is, what I want to talk to you today is about the perspective of policies, not parties. Policies. So I'll tell you something. I've been around long enough and involved in it long enough. It is amazing to me. The things that one party says now is their mantra. I remember when it was in the other party. So follow the policies that benefit your life, okay? And, and you'll end up in the, in, in the right party. But you, you need to know and understand government and its function. I'll tell you, one of the things that inspired some of the random comments I want to uh, talk with you about today is, um, you know, I have three Facebook pages, LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, blah, 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 Twitter, two Twitter accounts, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, there's a lot. I hear a lot. I'm the one answering all that stuff. And um, a person that I know, not well, but I know of, who I know has at least an undergraduate degree, who is involved in a reputable company here, in Columbus, and like I said, I, friends of friends, I, I know this guy, so I know him to be intelligent and successful, said on social media the other day, something to the effect of, I can't remember how he phrased it, but basically, he didn't know that the court system, the judicial system, was a third branch of government. <laughs> So, you know, I go on and I'm like, uh, hey, Billy Joe, which is not his name. Um, you know, actually, the court system is a co-equal branch of government. It's, a co it's the counter-majoritarian branch of government. It was designed that way because we have ma majorities elect, of course, the president and the legislature, and they respond to 50 plus 1 percent of the people, but the courts are the counter-majoritarian. So when somebody who's bigger and stronger than you comes to take your back 100 acres, you got a place to go. Because if they're more powerful and there's more of them, you ain't got a cause in the legislature or in the executive branch. It's the courts that will protect the minority interests. That doesn't necessarily be, mean race. Everybody gets so narrow when they're thinking. It could just mean you ain't powerful. And it's the courts that, you know, people say all the time they don't like regulation, all that good stuff. But it's the courts when you invent a product and a bigger corporation comes, you, you, you uh, develop some code in the back there. You develop some code and Google decides they need it. So they just take it. Who do you think is going to win that? You or Google? But you've taken the court you got to fight and chance at fair and fairness and justice. And that's because the courts are counter-majoritarian. So don't be an idiot on Facebook <laughs> by talking about stuff that you don't even know. Learn about your government, because frankly, this guy's in a particular kind of business. I ain't never going to that company. And I'm not saying being mean, I'm just saying, Ugh. What if he got hold of my account? My God, what would he what would he do? He doesn't even know we got three branches of government. I'm not sure how smart that guy is. So don't don't embarrass yourself and and have and diminish yourself in other people's eyes because you don't understand the basics about our society and our civic order and how it affects your business and what you what you want to do in life. Government is not a business. My God. People say this all the time, you gotta run it like a business. No you don't, it's exactly the opposite of a business. There's business, and then there's government. It's 
exactly the opposite. Now, does that mean if you're successful, you were the CEO of, of Synovus, might you be a good governor? Sure, you might be a good, good governor because you know how to manage people and presumably you know how to strategize and vision and you know all these kind of things. But you're going to need to translate how you were a great CEO at Synovus works in government because it's a completely different thing. And why? Why is government completely different? Let's talk about it for just a second. Harvey, Hurricane Harvey. What private business is going to rebuild Houston? Bill Gates? Bill Gates? I mean, he could. You know, we're going to need about $200 billion probably by the time it's done. It's going to take about a decade or more. I mean, the flood water may be gone, but trust me, it's going to take a decade or more. And so I guess Bill Gates, we could turn to him. So what, is he going to own it then? Is he going to own Houston after we let him? If we, once we take his $200 billion, is Bill Gates going to own Houston? Is that the way it's going to work? No. The only entity that can rebuild Houston is government. And you see people loving the government right now. Some of those people right now loving the government and all that it's going to do in this crisis management. Two months ago, we're trying to secede from the nation. And, and the reason why they were trying to secede and know this as leaders, I, you know, I love it when, when folks say, I'm a leader. I want to do it all by myself. I don't need anybody else. Well, sure, you don't need anybody else on sunshine days. I mean, hell, I could, you know, I could run a professional basketball team on a sunshine day. You know? But what about the dark days? What about when there ain't nobody coming to help you? You know, when, when the lights don't work and the toilets don't flush and the police couldn't get to you if you wanted them to. You know, I mean, who, who is going to help you? It's the government. So if Texas has seceded from the nation, Houston would never be rebuilt. Never. It would be abandoned. It would be a wasteland. They cannot do it on their own. That is the genius of the 50-state federation we have in this country. Learn about it, know about it, respect it, and don't let any of your friends sit there over beers and talk about how they hate the government. Because I tell you what, when they need it, they'll be the 911 of what they need. They'll be the first one lining up to come ask the government to help them. Government takes a long-term view. They are not interested in quarterly earnings. That's the beauty of the balance of government and business. You guys worry about your quarterly earnings. I'll worry about making sure you have a city to live in when you're cashing the check. We're the long-term view. You guys and your business will be the short-term quarterly view. That's the way it works. It's a balance. The yin and the yang of our, of our civic universe. Um, we focus on sustainable process and systems. Uh, the private sector fo focuses on uh, the marketability of products and services, and that's great. We we've got to make sure uh, not just that, that your kid has a school that, to go to, but that everybody has the same access to the same types of schools. It's about process. It's about systems. Um, our market segment is everyone. Your market segment are those people who have bought your product or might buy your product. Completely different. We don't just cater to voters. We actually have to provide good government to people who aren't even registered to vote. Like maybe some of you all, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Um, we have to protect resources that we don't necessarily own. The jurisdiction of Muskogee County is made up of hundreds, thousands of acres that the city doesn't own. But that's the jurisdiction that I and our elected officials are the stewards of. We don't sell products. We don't sell widgets. We don't build roads and then hold an auction. Anybody want to buy the sewer system? No. You know, it's not a business. We do not produce product for sale. We're stewards. We're fiduciaries. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that your private sector 
talents of management and fiscal responsibility and, and strategy aren't, aren't valuable as, as a public leader, but it's completely different and you need to understand the differences of the organizational construct, you need to understand the difference of the objectives of government, and you need to understand and respect that government is very complex. It can be very volatile because you have a lot of people you're serving. As I said, everyone's our market segment. And so, no, it can't be run by just anybody. Joe the plumber, Phil the pharmacist, Ted the tycoon cannot necessarily be a congressman, a governor, or a president. Unless they have a skill set and they have spent their adult life thinking about the complexities of policy and government, they are not qualified to be an elected official. Would you hire me as the state plumber? You know? I mean, can I just go to Delta and say, hey, I love this jet. How about you let me fly it just for the day? No. It requires a mas mastery. And I tell you, we've spent at least 30 years disrespecting government. You know, government's the problem. If you think government's the problem, you don't understand it. Government's part of the solution. Okay? So no, not just anybody can run it. We talked about the fact that it affects your schools, your roads, your stormwater, public health. I love this. You hate the government. What would you do if Ebola came to the United States in a serious way? Who are you going to call? You better hope that your local, state, and federal government has a plan to distribute the vaccines to where it needs to be, to quarantine people, to shut down cities and not let people in and out, to shut down airports but still allow commerce to continue. There ain't going to be some committee that you convene on that day that allows it to happen. It's because the government's been there every day thinking about those things. And they've got a plan. they got a plan. That's what the government's doing for you. The global financial infrastructure, why, why are our stocks more valuable? Have, uh, you guys, well, some of y'all in business should know this, but money markets, um, money uh, market accounts that are uh, domestic equities tend to perform better over time, right? International stocks, they, they can do pretty good too, but what, what do they look like? What's their performance record look like? And, and what's, what's the U.S. look like? Like this. Why is that? It's because the government's there regulating things to remove the volatility from the market. We have better investment. Why are so many Chinese and Russians trying to buy land and, and, and assets in the United States? What's wrong with their stuff? Because we're stable. Because of all that government hand helping set a framework for the free market. Um, national things too. Medicaid, Medicare, I love this. People hate Medicaid, Medicare. Ah, all those lazy people. Get them off all that stuff. They ain't enough churches or nonprofits in the world to provide medical care to your grandmother and your grandmother and your grandfather. And people who've fallen on hard times are stuck in some sort of systemic poverty. You are not going to soup kitchen your way out of that. It's because the government provides a framework in which its citizens can succeed and takes care of those who are struggling. And that doesn't just help them. It's not a pity party. It helps you. You know, it, it helps you. So that's, that's what the government is doing. The invisible hand of self-interest can only work if you have full information and full access. And the only reason you will have full information and full access for the invisible hand to make you all extremely profitable and successful as you dream to be is because the government's making sure that happens. So let's not hear any more about um, how much we hate the government. Let's start talking about what we understand about the government, what it can do for us. I will tell you, you've got some great uh, folks who've set the standard in Columbus, Georgia. You've heard about the public-private partnership. Uh, we do it better than anybody else. We even have, that's the 
the P3, we have P4, which includes Fort Benning, public-public, private partnership. Uh, we're working it all the time to leverage our resources um, and find innovative things to, that will help you and benefit your interests and the interests of the military and, and the interest of, of TSIS. And so, it, and, and Synovus and Aflac, you know, the business school of this college has had some great stewards and leaders. You know, you've had Bill Turner and Jimmy Blanchard. How many people went to the Jimmy Blanchard Forum? Anybody? You know, those are the folks, Jimmy Yancey, I'm sure I'm missing some, Phil Tomlinson, anyway, too many, Gardner Gerard, too many folks to, to, to rattle off by name. But those folks have been huge successes in the private sector because they understand the value of a partnership with the government. You know, why? Why don't you just go run thesis and pff, who cares what really happens in Columbus? You can't attract top tier talent if we don't have a quality of life they want to come to. You can't hire people to work your data centers if we don't have a workforce that's hireable. Now, you know, one thing the difference about the private sector and the government sector is that our return on investment is different, right? So you guys invest in a product and then you're going to decide how many of those you can sell and then how, what money you're going to get back from that. That's, that's great. Would any business invest in educating 30,000 kids, 300,000 kids, whatever size your city is, on the hopes that some of them might someday be able to work in a call center? What's the, what's the, risk of, what's the rate of return on that? You're going to build schools, hire teachers, get school buses, you know, and maybe some of those kids might come work at Aflac. Is that a, good, is that a return for you? No. Only the government can do that. Um, and so you stand on the shoulders of folks who've understood that for a very long period of time. That's why they helped us do the, the River Rapids, to create a quality of life and a vibrancy about the city that makes it attractive. Not, not just for the people that live here, but, but for people that might want to come and invest here, might want to come work here, and work for some of these organizations, might want to attend CSU. If you're some boring ugh, school in the middle of nowhere, you know, nobody want to come here. When you chose, if you can't come from somewhere, near, uh, somewhere else, when you chose to come here, you did so because this place had a quality of life that was appealing to you. Not, you could have the best curriculum in the world, but if you don't have a quality of life that is appealing, kids ain't coming here. Too many other, too many other choices. So, I'll start to to wrap this up by saying, don't say stupid things <laughs> about government. It makes people think you're not the one to be running their company or to get that job or whatever. Um, seek to influence uh, elected officials by picking the smart ones. Stop this Jersey business. I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, just because. Pick the, you pick the best, the best, most capable person for the job, and I guarantee you, both those parties will start competing for better policies that affect your life and stop this crap of this propaganda uh, that's going on now. Um, know who your elected officials are. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I, does anybody think they know who their state representative is? They're, I'm serious, they're, they're voting on stuff. They're going to be voting on stuff in January, God knows. Right? I mean, we know campus carries affect you in some way. That's the least of it. They cut funding for you, they give you funding, you know, and you don't even, don't even know who they are. You've got to read reputable media sources. Google them, man. I mean, you know, just Google them. Figure out which ones. There's so much crap, I can't even believe. Again, you talk about, I, I did a seminar the other day about um, social media. And there was somebody there from Aflac. And, and we do this too, particularly with law enforcement. But um, we, look, we, at, we look at your social media. And the woman from Aflac said that they have not hired people because they post stupid articles that are patently untrue from non-reputable media sources, things that are urban myths. You will lose a job. People are watching. They don't want anybody working for them that doesn't understand the difference between fiction and reality. 
So figure it out. There's still a lot to debate, but reality is something we got to agree on. Okay, so reality we're gonna we're gonna agree on. So uh, reputable media sources. Um, before you leave here, take a government course, take a history course, take a political science course. Okay. I know you're just interested in being an expert in, in what it is you think you want to do, but you, you need to understand those things because there's going to be times, I think every day, but certainly there's going to be moments where the government's going to intersect with, with your objective. So um, understand government, use it as a resource, be involved, insist that others respect it. Because the disrespect for our government is frankly what's, what's led us here today. Government's not the problem. Government's the solution, and the government's us, at least in this country. A um, couple quick things about leadership, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. You get uh, how many people here uh, in the have a leadership certificate or are in the leadership? Anybody here in that? Oh shoot, I should have added a whole section on leadership. I, um, but anyway, take one of those courses too. But, but, um, but CSU does such a great job uh, with leadership, leadership certificates and things of that nature. Um, but leadership is not management. Those two concepts are completely different. Uh, management is, of course, organizing uh, human resources or other resources to achieve an objective. And certainly, there's management involved in leadership. But to be a leader, you must be courageous. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the toughest person. I've seen meek and mild people lead in their moment, um, but, uh, but you have to have some courage about you. You have to be prepared to stand all alone. You know, I once was interviewing a guy in a law firm, and as I said, we did a particular type of law that was really tough, and he had been president of the student body at the University of Georgia. He had been in, was it Iron Grid? Is that what it's called, the Iron? Anyway, Iron Grid, I think, is what it's called. He had been uh, homecoming king. And, uh, you know, good looking guy, big fraternity and all that. And I said, um, are you prepared to be unpopular? And I mean, he was shocked, you know, because he never thought about it. But that's leadership. You have to be prepared to be unpopular for a better objective. You have to be prepared to make that decision if you need to. I mean, hopefully you have the luxury of urging people to join you in this effort and, and that type of thing. But if you don't, in that moment in time, if you got a choice between the right thing that's leadership and being popular, if you're a leader, you have to choose. You have to choose leadership and hopefully temporary unpopularity. Uh, leaders have to be prepared for crisis as well as the good days. We've talked about that. Um, Anybody can lead in good times. Frankly, that's management. The difference between leadership in good times, uh, frankly, and just management is, is full optimization, right? Because anything that's humming along is going to keep humming along as long as you keep the lights on and, and people basically in the right cubicles and that kind of thing. But, but the difference between a great leader on a, running a healthy, strong organization and a management style leader is optimization. But the difference between a leader on a bad day and somebody who's not a leader on that bad day is the death knell of your organization. You know, I'm making a huge error. United Airlines. If you pull a beat the, out of that guy and then, and then give some press statement that's like, you know, that's, that's the difference between leadership and management on a bad day. Uh, and it's, it's essential. It could be, could be the death knell of your organization. Um, I could go on, but I'm not gonna. Um, I hope you've gotten a little bit of the storytelling, a little bit of the preaching, a little bit of the teaching. Um, but I do want to open it up for questions. Leadership is a, um, it's a privilege. Uh, it's a joy and it is a burden, you know. But if you're able, if you have the ability, you have the responsibility to serve. Public service uh, elected positions are about service, they're not about power. So if anybody comes to you selling power, that person may be something 
but is not a public servant capable of being in elected office. It's not about power, because it's about a whole lot of this. You know, you feel like, you know, almost every single day you feel like you've given, you've left a little bit of your soul on the floor because you're being a steward for 200,000 people. And, and that's public service, and it is rewarding, but it can be trying to, anyway. All right, so they are like telling me they're turning out the lights. I know they've already turned out the air. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, thank you all very, very much. Please join me in thanking our mayor again for coming. We are so fortunate to have her. I mentioned to you when we started, we're very fortunate to have her as our mayor. And we want to give her a small gift as a token of our appreciation for being here today. Uh, this is a pin set with the Turner College's logo on it, and we hope that you're going to use it to sign some well, bills that you do agree with. I do agree All with. Right. Thank you so much.